Hello everyone, it's Cam with H2K9. We'll just call it that to streamline it. I'm gonna pop you the phone on the tripod in just a second, but I figured I'd keep you free floating because you're all gonna wanna see the puppy. Um, we have a new member here at uh, Home2K9, a new buddy, and he just came to me two days ago, and it's kind of a long story that I'm not gonna get into all the details on, but it's full of serendipity. It was extremely emotional. Um, and a really, really special experience to find this guy in the timing that I did. It was not, uh, it was not planned. It was not expected, I should say, um, but very much wanted and celebrated as of late. So if we're not connected personally on Facebook, you will not know that little King Laszlo has joined the crew. I'm going to flip you. Actually, he's, he's at my feet, so he's kind of, he's kind of helping me to show you this way. So Lazla joined, uh, joined me two days ago. He's a little baby boxer. He's eight and a half weeks old. Are you eating my chair? Hmm? Is that what you're doing? You wanna come out and say hi to everybody? Say, there I am. I'm eating leaves. And <laughs> this guy, so I'll tell you a little bit. Um, this guy uh, is, was from a breeder that I expected to wait into next year to source a pup from. Hey, Linda, but uh, I was very fortunate that um, she missed my email a month ago and when I called her up on the phone recently um, and we started to chat, she said, well, I have a show prospect here and we talked about the show, show prospect, the co-ownership contract for that and she hadn't done the final measurements and pictures to decide if he was in fact, I'm gonna put you on the tripod, hang on, if he was in fact going to be um, used for show or not and so she sent me the pictures from later that day the stack photos <laughs> um, and said you know long story short uh, he's a really nice looking puppy but we've decided we would be willing to let him go to a companion home such as yours and so voila I was headed up to see their program and meet them in person um, meet all the parents they're all very they're all health tested they're all temperament you know assessment was beautiful on this dog we did it the day that I went up to meet him um, and I had lots of requirements in this area right so when I shared him on my personal Facebook page um, Becca who interned with us for a while asked for more details of you know how do you go about selecting a puppy and a breeder uh, comes into that conversation as well and it's a huge topic for me to have to type an answer to. It's simply impossible if you ask me with the limitations of time that I have to, to answer it that way. So I'm gonna dive in for the next 25 minutes or so and just share some of my top tips with you guys as efficiently as I can. And I will give you another glance, I promise. I know you guys are much preferring to see this one versus me. Um, he's really attached to me already. He's been a super shadow. Um, and he's a really, really good little puppy. As you can see, he routinely just curls up at my feet, finds something to do um, to entertain himself. He's been, he's been a really easy, enjoyable guy in this department. He's been absolutely terrible at self-soothing in the crate. So we are working on that. Of course, it's only day two, but um, he's pretty stinking fun, you guys, and he's healing me uh, rapidly. He's filling the hole, the big, big hole that my Bosley left. I can't, I couldn't even begin to explain to you how hard uh, it's been to be without that boy and you know having this little dude come into my life uh, is the best thing that's happened in two months so Okay, you got to come back to me for a minute and then I'll, I'll let you have more puppy in a little bit He's gonna go chase a leaf So if <laughs> I'm late because of the baby right the baby made me late y'all know how that goes. It's a, it's a real issue um, and then I may get distracted. <laughs> I, I, I may have to pop up and go like, you know, save his life or something. Um, but we will get to answering a few of the questions that Becca posed. I know I am too, Carrie, it's, it's never gonna go away. Uh, I've decided that's just the bottom line. He's a, he is an extremely special, special dog and a really, really, really important part of my life. So, ooh, but no more crying, we have to, move forward and celebrate what we had and um, appreciate, which I'm working to cultivate with you all in the lounge this month, appreciate what's there, not what's missing. And I think if we apply this to every area of our life, we can like 10X our joy because 
Um, it's a big mistake and bad habit when our attitude is focused on lack, for lack of a better word, when our, when our um, focus and our attention is directed towards what we wish would change or what we don't, you know, um, have, possess, whatever. Instead, when we put all of our energy, um, any area, specifically dogs, when we put our energy into what's there and we notice and appreciate what our dogs bring to the table, we're more capable of fulfilling on who they are and their needs, personality, temperament, etc., and appreciating the opportunities that they bring to us to become more grounded, to slow down, to connect with nature, something that is extremely vital to our optimal health. Um, there's a spiritual element that's really, really significant um, and available to us in our relationship and experience of animals in general, I think, um, and our relationship with our dogs certainly presents that. I would say I became a much more spiritual person over the course of being an adult and deepening my relationships with dogs and understanding how to appreciate them for who they are. So, um, you know, we're spending some time in the leader's lounge. If you're not in there still, uh, why? Come join us because it's such a positive and powerful group of people. It is such a wonderful space to share what you're doing to move the needle in your goals, in your mission, in your vision. Um, hey, Kinsey. It is such a powerful place to, um, you know, to share feedback and encouragement for people who are staying the course with difficult challenges in their life and who are determined to make something really beautiful out of it. So that's what we do over there. We lead, we lead from the front with a good attitude, good intention, um, you know, making the most of every moment, right? And not wasting any time that we get in this precious thing called life. And certainly um, in the context of what our dogs invite us to do, but also in so many other ways, up-leveling our relationships, our businesses, our community offerings. So he is stupid cute behind the camera here. Awesome, Amanda, I'm so glad. I love having you in there. Um, so in the lounge every day this month, I'm gonna pop in and share a gratitude with you guys um, that's specific to my experience of dogs. And um, I would love for you to join me. I think it's such an amazing way for us, a simple, free, awesome way for us to take two to five minutes and just ground ourselves with our responsibilities that are right in front of us and our commitments that we've made to these animals by noticing what's there and appreciating what they bring to the table. So, like I said at the top of the broadcast, if you just joined in, puppy's loose, and I may have to go save his life or something. If I have to jump up and do that, you get to chuckle and just sit tight. I'll be right back, okay? But he's generally a really, really good boy. Hey, Carrie Ann, how you feeling, lady? And I'll show you what he does. He just, such a good boy. Such a good boy. Hey guys, it's really toasty today. It's November 2nd in Southern California, and it's like freaking 89 degrees. All right, so we're talking puppies. Um, answering this question for Becca, and I'm gonna do my best to get kind of a part one, probably. I don't know that this will be everything, but Becca asked, how do you select a puppy? And I said, whoa, Nelly, that's a huge question. And the reason is because you need to select a puppy that's right for you in your life, and you in your life is vastly different from one person to the other, right? So if you're a working uh, individual who's banker's hours plus a commute, you work Monday through Friday and you get home at six or 7 p.m. and you're exhausted um, and you typically like to watch television and go to bed, you need a Hudson. Uh, you need to adopt an adult dog that is lazy and loves to hold the couch down with you. A dog that is mature, that has gone through all the puppy stuff, you don't get a puppy at all, okay? If you are someone like me who works from home and is with your dog all the time and has extra energy and attention to be able to pay to um, potty training and um, behavior training, giving that dog some fulfillment in terms of you know various sports or creative outlets for drive, if you have a lot of time or your lifestyle simply revolves around little intersections of availability like that, then by all means, a puppy might make sense for you. Even still, if you're very, very busy in your entrepreneurial endeavors or your work from home job life, you're tethered to your desk, you can't take lots of breaks willy nilly whenever you feel like it, you only get certain times that you can leave your phone availability, for example, um, then even still you need to think about whether a puppy is right for you. I can think of many circumstances in which you should absolutely not get a puppy. And the very first objective in telling you how to select the right puppy is to tell you when to not go looking for a puppy. 
Um, if you're emotionally in a rut right now and you just broke up with somebody and you're feeling really sad and lonely, don't get a puppy, you'll wreck it. If you are um, traveling across the country and moving to a location for the first time that you've never been to and you don't have a stable job and you don't know where you're going to live and you don't know how you're going to pay for your life, please don't get a puppy. There is no puppy that is right for you. You are likely to screw that puppy up. Puppies need structure, stability. They need a lot of time and a lot of attention. They also need somebody who's strong enough to give them some firm consequences, direction, correction. They need space and opportunities for exploration to condition and stimulate their minds so that they develop into the adult dog you're dreaming of. Don't, um, but, and, and don't stay in an atrophied state of lack of development because they didn't get exposure, they didn't get that attention and that in, um, intention that is so powerful to creating a great relationship long-term and a great adult dog. So don't get a puppy unless you absolutely can respect the fact that you're raising an adult dog, that you're going to be interrupted in the night, that you're going to be interrupted in the day, that you're going to have potty accidents and you're going to have to hand feed gross, disgusting things potentially to teach and cultivate engagement and condition your puppy to love to work for you, to um, shape that those obedience commands, to you know make it fun and desirous for them to work for you and to create that bond you're looking for into adulthood. Um, if, you're, if you know that you're in the right place uh, to get a puppy, if you maybe it's not just you, um, but you have a partner in crime that you're going in on this little adventure with and you're gonna be able to tag team and tap out when one's tired and you've got a lot of support to navigate a proper infant schedule um, and to bring that enrichment stuff into your puppy's life, then it becomes about even, even still assessing your personality, your temperament, your energy. You can very easily select the wrong puppy for you even if your lifestyle circumstances are puppy appropriate. Um, what you should be looking for is starting from the breed and then working your way down to personality and temperament per puppy. So make sure you research the breed. This is why this conversation is enormous, you guys. I'm not gonna get into every little detail, but make sure you've researched the breed. Puppy selection has to do with breed, lifestyle, temperament, age selection. It's all of the above that goes into figuring out whether or not that's the right little one for you. Hey, Allie. So first and foremost, your breed research. Have you had a dog of this nature before? If you're attracted to a dog breed you've never had before, talk to everyone and their mother about what it's like to have this type of dog. The internet is an amazing thing these days for situations of research. You can get online, you can look up a lot of information, you can contact, best case scenario, contact credible dog trainers and credible breeders. What is this dog really like to live with? What is their best case scenario placement? Make sure you do this research, people. I cannot tell you how many folks come to me disappointed or frustrated or stretched really thin having to come up with training investment funds they didn't plan for, not because they're excited to spend the money to get professional training and to have a dog that has precision um, obedience on board, but because they're in reactive mode. They're in struggle, frustration, exhaustion, or danger. The dog has literally gone so far off the rails to make decisions like biting, running, um, it has had injuries or it's injured others. So knowing your breed, many of these cases, it is a dog breed that the individual was attracted to, but didn't understand the very predictable nuance of what it would be like to live with this dog and the kind of person who is um, best suited to be with this dog, okay? So I wanna encourage you guys, making sure you're looking at the breed first and foremost, within the context of that breed, a breeder, if you're going to a breeder that is reputable, this is a huge conversation as well on its own, but I've done an audio call on this before and it's parked on our website. I'm pretty sure it's available on our YouTube. We have to verify that for you, but I have done a great interview with my friend and breeder and highly respected judge uh, for barn hunt about how to select appropriate breeders. So if you're going to an appropriate breeder, they're gonna help you a lot in terms of um, if they are doing their job properly, they're gonna ask you a lot of questions about your lifestyle, your family, your stability, your job, your financial uh, situation, in, in, uh, perhaps, especially in the cases of things like bulldogs, dogs that have a lot of health issues they're prone to or need a lot of proactive um, high-end food and healthcare to prevent them from having issues genetically. Uh, expressed genetically, I should say. 
So a really good quality breeder is gonna wanna know you really well and establish a long-term relationship with you, not just grab one, give it to you, and that's the end of your dynamic. They're going to have a quality contract for you to review that is going to, um, at a minimum, ensure that the breeder is committed to the puppy for its, the life of the puppy. If anything goes wrong and you can't keep it, that puppy should go back to the breeder. That should be contractual between you and your breeder. Um, your breeder should have information in that contract about the health guarantees, the health assessments that they've done. Um, they often will prompt for you to get the dog, the puppy assessed by a veterinarian within three to five days to verify that that puppy is healthy. They will give you food to get you started. They will talk with you about being safe and appropriate for your puppy in terms of exposure and, and avoiding exposure to various um, diseases, not going certain places. They will make themselves very available to meet you where you're at in your knowledge base and to fill in the gaps wherever possible. Um, if you meet their dogs, this is really important, you must be able to meet their dogs. A reputable breeder wants you to meet their adult dogs. They want you to meet the offspring from maybe other litters. They'll be able to give you references of people who have purchased from them before. These are all nuanced things about a reputable breeder. Now, if you're asking me about puppy in general, and you weren't thinking of getting a puppy from a breeder, maybe you have a bias um, you believe that buying from breeders is evil and terrible when there are a gajillion dogs sitting in shelters. Well, as you know, guys, I run a nonprofit dog rescue as well, and we take in a lot of dogs for rescue. Um, we have a lot of training that has to go into those dogs in order to turn them around and make them better adoption candidates and to help adoptive families succeed with those dogs long term. And I can tell you right now that buying from a credible breeder is one of the ways in which you support the maintenance of the health of a particular breed and lineage of dog. It's one of the ways in which you can contribute to being responsible in your dog ownership and set yourself up for better success, selecting the dog that's right for you and then cultivating that dog correctly from the start. There's a reason people are drawn to getting dogs from reputable breeders um, and starting with puppies you know, from, from a good breeder because it gives you a lot of opportunity to eliminate the risks that you are literally inviting and walking towards with most rescue dogs. Now, that doesn't mean that getting a puppy is right for everyone, as I said at the top of the broadcast. That doesn't mean that there aren't amazing dogs in rescue. There are exceptions to the rule in, in every case, right, with life. And in rescue, we find a lot of amazing dogs that absolutely deserve second chances, sometimes third and fourth chances and we're very happy to do the work that we do. That said, we also get a lot of dogs that are a total and, and utter uh, you know, devastation to an adopter. Behaviorally, they're extremely challenging. Uh, physically, they have many issues because they, are, they were not intentional puppies, right? They were not intentional litters that were cultivated to move purebred lines forward in a really responsible and healthy way. Um, you know, the majority of dogs that come into rescue, truly, truly, we're talking majority of dogs that come into rescue are what would be considered backyard bred dogs, accidental litters, mixed breed dogs, or bully breed dogs that were, um, you know, too hard for people to handle or mishandled. Um, most of these dogs that we get were never abused. That is a common misconception. Most of these dogs were never abused. In fact, unless you consider, which I do, a lack of discipline and direction and training abuse, um, we, we almost never see a dog come through here that has been abused. We see dogs that were the wrong dog for the wrong family, a puppy at the wrong time, not trained, not corrected for behaviors that were inappropriate, that would lead to long-term dynamics, that would cost that dog a place in their family home. So in that context, it is really unfortunate what these dogs go through 99.9% .9 of the time, getting bounced around because they're determined too hard to handle or too far gone or there isn't a training method that works. But ironically, we get them here and they've never been put on balanced tools. They've never been, uh, not never, most have never been on remote collar, often never a prong collar, often not crate trained, not corrected for jumping, mouthing, whining, anxiety issues have not been corrected. They've been coddled and or um, you know fueled. So I'm getting a little bit off track here, but I'm, I'm trying to help you understand Becca's question of how to select a puppy 
It is humongous, ladies and gentlemen, right? It's an argument of purebred versus mud. It's an argument of rescue versus buying. It's an argument of which breed is right for you and whether or not um, you know, the, the time in your life, your personality, your temperament is appropriate to raise a puppy. And then we start talking about temperament assessments and we start talking about environmental influences. If you get a quality breeder involved here and you're sourcing a purebred dog from a quality breeder, the other big factor is that that breeder must understand um, whelping and development of puppies, how crucial their developmental um, opportunities are from birth to 12 weeks. If you miss that birth to 12 weeks window, there's no going back on some things that are crucial to setting the stage for that dog's life, that puppy's life as an adult dog, believe it or not. So this is why people like to get their puppies in that sweet spot of you know nine to 12 weeks uh, still available for you to condition and pattern and develop some things along, but some breeders will wanna hold that puppy longer toward the 12 week mark, depending on, hey Bill, depending on the breed, um, you know, depending on the puppy itself, a really good breeder will be selective. They might even say, this puppy actually should stay longer with me. It, it needs some more experience with its litter mates or with adult dogs or whatever the case may be. So temperament assessments, which we follow the uh, Volhard assessment, which is meant to be done at 49 days. Temperament assessments, that's seven weeks of age, will give you, I will, Bill, and he's right down here being a little champion buddy. That is his default. I mean, he absolutely, his only problem is he absolutely has separation anxiety. He, he came that way. He's like super clingy, hates to be away from me. So I have, I'm working hard in that department and it's annoying. But um, for, for our purposes, for me to be able to do this and not have screaming in the crate in the background, uh, he, he got to be free for a moment and passed out. So um, just kind of talking about how big this conversation is about you know, what puppy's right for you, there's so many factors, right? There's so many factors. What kind of money do you have? Do you have money to throw around? Puppies are expensive. Um, you know, do you, are you prepared to feed a biologically appropriate diet so that you don't develop issues in your adult dog based on putting crap food in your puppy? Um, you know, do you have the you know veterinary expense fund ready and, and accessible to you? Because there's a lot that goes into checkups and development of that puppy, making sure they're good, and a lot of things that can go wrong, right? Um, puppies eat stuff. Despite our best efforts, they will get stung by a bee. They will eat a sock. They will do you know any number of things. They get into trouble, and you got an emergency expense going on that you don't expect. I was sitting in the ER recently with one of the rescue dogs that we have in the program. Um, he was actually seeing ophthalmology at a VCA. And next to me was a couple with their puppy who is, I don't know, six or seven months old. And they were absolutely devastated because the puppy had jumped off the bed and hurt herself. And they were super self-conscious that they're terrible dog owners, that this happens. Like, I heard the husband literally say, this happens, stuff happens, don't worry, it's okay. Um, because the, the, the woman was feeling really, really terrible about it. So do you have the funds ready? These are questions that are so much more important to ask yourself before you meet any dogs, before you start selecting any dogs. And then you can go in, eyes wide open. Yeah, puppies are high maintenance, even for dog pros. And this is what I'm telling you, you guys. I had to make a very careful decision, right? This, is, this was thought about on many levels above and beyond in spite of the fact this is my lifestyle. I do this stuff day in and day out. It is absolutely expected for me um, to have a dog or seven and to you know have life revolve around this, this dynamic. But even still, I'm wiped out today. Puppy kept me up all night last night working through the crate nonsense. So you really have to have um, self-awareness. You really have to be honest about your circumstances. Do you have stability in your life? Are you going to commit to this dog for the next 10 to 15 years? Um, are you going to uh, you know, make sacrifices in your life if you have to, should things come up unexpectedly, either financial or logistical? And, and those are more important to answer before you ever even meet puppies. And the vast majority of dog owners, I find, should never ever get a puppy. Um, it's just that easy to screw it up if things aren't lined up in your life for it. And, and then it's not fun, right? It's really not fun. It takes the fun out of it. So if you are telling me, yes, Cam, I know, I got it. We're you know, a big family. Someone's home full time. We're ready to do the whole thing or we've done it before. We're experienced. We know what we're walking into. 
Um, then I would say temperament assessment. As I said, we like the Volhard test that's done at 49 days, and that gives you insight into the dog's drives. It gives you insight into their sociability. Um, it tells you their personality, basically, right? The same way you would personality test a human, you can temperament test your puppy. And so when I went to meet this little guy, he had to score fours and fives. That was my requirement on that test. He had to be a well-balanced, sociable, outgoing, good recovery. He had to have a little bit of drive, not too much and not none. Um, and then that would be something that I could work with. He got a couple threes on that test. So if you go look up that test, you'll see that threes show us he's a little drivey, a little on the drivier side for a boxer. Um, which is kind of exciting because that means I can probably have some fun with this guy doing some bite work long term and um, you know have a good outlet for him to um, get some energy drain and bonding and connection together but all in all fours and fives so that's just a good natured well balanced easy going overall good family dog a dog you're not gonna theoretically have to work really hard to develop properly um, a dog that should take corrections well, that should recover well from stress, nervousness, trauma, um, that should forgive well, things like that. So yeah, I'm a dog trainer and I wanted an easy dog. I wanted a dog that was gonna be neutral in my life, that was gonna drop into the pack dynamic, that was gonna bond well with me, but also respect and, and, and be a good study and be a very trainable dog. So temperament testing is really important and if you don't know how to do that, this is where I say, Bring a great trainer into your life for this purpose. Reach out to a great trainer and see if they will do a consultation fee to assess a puppy that you might be considering or go meet a litter with you and help you to identify behavioral characteristics that are present in that litter that will predict your long game with that dog. There is so much that we can see in hindsight as trainers and rescuers and rehabilitating behavioral issues there's so much that we can see in hindsight when clients come and tell us their cases of we got the puppy from here and it, it was this breeder lived like this and their place was like this or we never saw it. Um, the puppy was shipped to me and this is how we set things up in the early days with that dog. This is some of the behavior stuff that the dog was showing right early on. We can hear these case studies, right, and say, um, yeah, sorry Z, we can hear these, you don't need another puppy anytime soon anyway, so you're good. Um, you know, the, these, these are scenarios that are very predictable that we could have told you back then if you had called us in to meet the puppy before you committed, we could have said, that dog's gonna be trouble for you down the line. You guys don't match up in your energy or your lifestyle, you don't have enough time and availability for what that puppy's going to need. This is why thinking about breeds specifically is so important, determining what breed is right for you because there are characteristics and qualities of every breed that hold true pretty damn consistently throughout that breed. There's absolute exceptions and outliers, but you know the reason I got another boxer is because I love boxers. I've had boxers now for 16 years. I'm very experienced with the breed, and every boxer I've had has had constants that have been the same in each and every one of them. Nuance to their personality, their disposition, their trainability, their energy, um, they, just all kinds of things, right? The way they play, the way they uh, interact with people, how sociable they are with people, how friendly they are with kids. So when you find a breed that makes sense, it's a good match for you, you'll notice over time there's some constants. And this is what's great about talking to people that have had that breed and talking to breeders of a breed you're interested in before getting it if you've never had it before. Because there are some inalienable truths that people will tell you. Um, reasons why Malinois and Rottweilers or German Shepherds or Bulldogs or Chihuahuas are not great for certain people are because of the constants that are predictable within the nature of that group of dogs. So um, where was I guys? I was just talking about the fact that um, I went for the same dog I've had so many times because I love them. I know them in and out. They make sense to me. There's a good energy match of tenacity. I'm a strong leader. I know what I'm doing so I can meet that type of dog and deal with the attitudinal and willful stuff that shows up in boxers and then also get this extreme loyalty because they're fulfilled, um, they're socialized in my lifestyle, etc. Yeah, so Kinsey, there are so many of you that are really great and well-suited to shepherds because you appreciate their drive, their work ethic, their desire to connect with their handler and to go full tilt in some of these different areas of expression um, for how they're built and genetically set up. 
But if you're a kind of person that I mentioned at the top of this conversation who wants to come home from a 12 hour work day and park it in front of Netflix and you know, doesn't wanna be out in the cold and crap in the winter months and in the dark in the early morning before work, do not get a shepherd or a working breed dog. Don't do it, it's so foolish. And any little bit of discomfort and heartache and struggle and frustration you experience, you deserve if you do not heed that message. So, um, you know, picking your puppy when you go with a mixed breed puppy through rescue, let's say, let's bring that conversation uh, or that, that part of the, the narrative into the mix here. This is what happens when you do that. You don't know anything about the fucking dog and you're guessing. You're taking a complete and total guess. What breeds are in there? What are the characteristics that are predictable that are gonna come out? Um, oh, I love cattle dogs, Bill, too. I do love them, but they are absolutely not for everyone. We've had two come through our rescue because they were too high maintenance, too much energy needed, or too smart. They were bored stiff with other people. So, mixed breed rescue. There's some amazing dogs in rescue. I have one in the other room. He's a boxer, bulldog, mashup, who knows? He was a stray, he's amazing. I love that dog. He's also had massive health issues, you guys. He didn't get the right start. He's had huge immune deficiencies, major health expenses throughout his life with me. And that is par for the course with, I don't know your background, I don't have control over your genetics, you were probably an oopsie litter um, and you know, onward and upward, right? We get what we get and that is, that's, that's all there is to it. Is he super balanced socially? No, I don't use him for any of my dog stuff in my business because that's not his jam. He's not solid enough in that department. He's much better with people. So there's some work we've done together as a team over the years in therapy work that's been great. For dogs, that's what the little booper down here is for, okay? So it's really important that you have respect for that. You go and meet a rescue puppy, a mixed breed puppy, even a purebred puppy that wasn't intentional or that didn't have the follow through available to it of a quality reputable breeder that it should have gone back to. Here it's bounced itself into a shelter, for example, or, or a rescue organization. Now you have a dog with cumulative stress, it's unavoidable, and you very likely also have a puppy with overload to their system either of vaccines. When puppies come into shelters and rescues, the first thing they have to do is shoot them up. If they have no background on whether the dog's been vaccinated, they shoot them up. They gotta get those vaccines in there. That is their MO, toot sweet, because otherwise that puppy could be a risk or be at risk. Now what happens when you vaccinate a puppy that was already vaccinated, you absolutely carpet bomb their immune system and you put them in major risk for autoimmune disease. You put them at major risk for vaccinosis issues from that uh, crap in their system that is now not just toxic in the, in the levels that are recommended, but absolutely double toxic when they're overloaded with vaccines they did not need that they already received. So more dogs that come through uh, shelters and rescues, puppies that you don't have a background on genetically, puppies that you don't have a background on for health um, or temperament assessment are gonna put you at higher risk. This does not mean that it's a no-go on, on a, getting your puppy as an adopted puppy from a shelter or rescue, but they are at higher risk for health issues, behavior issues, for having um, more struggles to get leveled off because they've been through cumulative stress experiences. They need to be detoxed physically. So um, really important that these puppies get to a holistic veterinarian in my opinion, that they get specific herbal medicinal detox through homeopathy or Chinese medicine to help their system calm down and combat the inflammatory response to the overload of vaccines or to help get out of their system the viruses that they're carrying. There is virus that they're exposed to, that's a vaccine. And a lot of them have it coursing through their system in an overload amount because they've been over vaccinated or they were vaccinated when they were um, already sick, right? If the dog is inflammatory in their immune system because they're even stressed or they've been having crappy food or they've been malnourished, then that vaccine is even worse in, in terms of the timing and how the body responds to it. My pleasure, Bill, I think it's so important. Um, it's just, this is why it's so hard, Becca, if you get on this replay later, to answer this question when you commented on my personal Facebook post, because it is a massive, massive conversation of you taking 100% responsibility for where you're at, your lifestyle, your energy, your personality, 
um, your understanding of a breed, your patience and willingness to wait for a proper breeder if you're looking to source a puppy from a breeder and your patience and diligence and willingness to wait if you're looking for a puppy in a rescue context. Um, there are many, there's an abundance of unwanted puppies in rescues and shelters. Your puppy, the one that's right for you, needs to be something you're willing to wait and be careful and conscientious about patiently looking for with all of these details in mind. Do I know the um, genetics of the puppy? No. Okay, so we're guessing that it's this breed combo. Uh, what do I know about those breeds individually? What do I imagine then would be possible if you smash them together? Um, one thing that people love to get around here, which comes back to Bill's comment, is like dogs that look like cattle dog mixes or a, like a lab terrier, um, you know, uh, like setter mix or a pit lab mix. These are dogs that are energy full. They are drive rich. They need a job to do. They are going to be outsmarting you in no time. They are going to be bored stiff in no time. It is so predictable when you have the shelter saying, we don't wanna call it a pit bull, so they're gonna be like, it's a terrier lab, right? Or it's a pointer, you know, um, pointer boxer, right? It's like, guys, even if you are trying to get that by and, and, and trying to make me believe it's not some sort of pity mix, those breeds predictably are you know, gonna give you tons of information about your long game lifestyle requirements with this dog. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to get your dog into sheep herding? Are you ready to do tracking with your dog? Are you ready to do agility with your dog every weekend and weeknights after work? Um, because that is what's required to get through that you know, eight, nine weeks, 12 weeks of adoption, or maybe you're getting the puppy at four, five, six months of age, to get them through to five, six years of age when they're like finally starting to chill the fuck out and be really enjoyable. Um, so big picture, guys, when it comes to puppy selection, you've really got to think big picture. And to be honest with you, um, you know, I'm more and more as a rescue director and somebody that has been involved in adopting and training and owning and putting down dogs in the rescue realm for nearly 17 years. I more and more want to see people source from reputable breeders. I more and more want to see people stay the course with their dog and not turn it into a shelter or a rescue, period. Wherever that dog comes from, may it be the last stop with you. May it be the last stop. If you commit to a puppy, stop complaining. The second you start complaining, the second you start saying, this puppy's just not trainable, or you know, oh, I got a divorce, or my job changed, that puppy is your responsibility. Don't you dare think that those things are excuses for walking away from that dog and dumping that dog on somebody else because it was fucking predictable, dude. Predictable. If you don't have stability, if you don't have a backup plan for what happens if all of those things were to be a part of your life, don't get a puppy. Get a lazy ass dog that is accepted by your renter's insurance and then you can keep that dog with you because they're quiet when you go to work for 12 hours. They're gonna be calm in a crate. They're gonna be respectful of your space if you gotta move in with a roommate. They're not gonna need a ton of your attention to fulfill them. They're not gonna have a ton of anxiety when you've got to you know, change things up and you're going through your stress of the, the upheaval in your life. It is not a time to get a puppy if you can't answer to those things that you know, you'll be able to have solutions should they come up because they just do, guys. That's life, right? That's life. They just absolutely happen. And there are so many adult dogs that absolutely need homes. I totally agree. Um, there's a ton of dogs that once they hit that adult stage or that senior stage, you can actually know who they are really readily, especially through reputable organizations where these dogs are being fostered. If you go and adopt an adult dog that's been fostered, you're gonna have a lot of information about what the lifestyle is like with that dog. How do they do in a home with kids or cats or other dogs? Um, are they nervous of new people? Do they like to be in a rural environment? Are they comfortable in the city? Um, you're gonna be able to get a lot more information out of that. You're gonna be able to hone in on where you're at right now and what makes sense to match up with that. Not starting from scratch and leaving yourself so vulnerable or leaving that puppy so vulnerable to cumulative stress and upheaval and being discarded when it gets too tough. It is predictably tough, guys. This is what it is. And it's an amazing invitation and opportunity to learn a lot about yourself, to become a better leader, to become more resilient, to be a better finisher by following through on these things and working through those sacrifices that you're going to have to make in order to be a good owner. 
Um, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lot about communication. You'll learn a lot about your energy. And, and as I said earlier, I think that spirituality piece is really incredible invitation that we can up level on account of our relationship with animals, let alone a dog. It's like right here all day, every day with you. Um, but there's so many times in which, you know, you ask me, how do you select a great puppy? And really the answer is going to be, you need a puppy like you need a hole in your head. Um, do not get a puppy. So um, it's, a, it's a hard conversation to answer in short, and there are a lot of different facets to it, as you've heard, at least from where I sit. And I would love to see us be far more responsible about where we source puppies from, um, why and when we do, and respecting people who purchase from reputable breeders and not having this nonsense narrative of, you know, to only adopt because a lot of adoptable dogs are amazing and a lot of adoptable dogs are a mess and they are absolutely too much for the average dog owner. Um, so it goes both ways. It's not, it's not a one size fits all in either direction, right? There's choices that you can make. Um, the key thing across the board that does not change, in my opinion, is whatever you get, stay the fucking course. Stay committed to your dog. Whatever direction you go, you, you brought that on yourself. Stay with it, please. Get a puppy, raise a puppy, do the best damn job ever, enjoy a long, happy life, great. Get an adult dog, rescue, give a dog a second chance. Um, you know, be somebody who's part of a solution of, you know, saving unwanted dogs from unnecessary euthanasia. Great. Do it. Do it full tilt, man. Do it with your whole ass, right? Not half ass. Um, it doesn't matter whichever way you go, stick it out, right? Because we definitely see this is a human issue. We see purebred purchased puppies with, with people that thought they knew what they were getting into and then they're coming in here struggling and wanting to surrender the dog. Um, you know, or they're struggling to keep the dog happy and to have a safe life with it because they didn't get the puppy part right and now we've got a dog that is um, out of control and, and potentially dangerous. We see all sides of this coin here, guys, and the bottom line is these are human issues when we're talking about dog issues and whatever way you decide to go, you've got to do it full tilt with it being non-negotiable to stop and give up at any, any point along the way. You've got to stick it out. Um, so I think I'm going to leave that part one right there for you. And if you have follow-up questions for me about this, uh, feel free to comment them. I can come back and do kind of a part two, but, um, you know, that feels like a good place to leave it for today in terms of talking about, you know, Hey, puppy time, how do I select a puppy that's right for me? All this stuff has to come first, guys. It's incredibly important. We can't have the conversation of what puppy is right for you. If we don't have the conversation of is a puppy right for you at all? And what are the potential consequences or risks and benefits to going, uh, you know, with one scenario or the other? Um, reputable breeders oftentimes are going to have a long history of genetic background, health testing. Um, I will pick him up in a second. He's asleep right now. Um, health testing, right? They're going to have looked at, you know, multiple generations of dogs for an absence of the breed's specific health risks where they tend to come up with certain things like boxers are really unhealthy dogs even from a really good breeder you're a high risk with a boxer of cancer they're just lumpy bumpy dogs in their senior years you're at a high risk of lymphoma um, DM which is a degenerative issue in the spine the dogs often end up in wheelchairs when they're older so um, boxers just tend to have a lot of these types of problems. They're known issues, alopecia even, and gut problems. This is all the more reason why it was important to me as an educated dog owner to start from this place this time, not to start from uh, a rescue place where I don't have the background information on the dog. Uh, Bosley was a rescue dog and he was not even six years old, died from lymphoma. He came from a California shelter uh, and his whole entire litter, the two parents and the litter were surrendered to the shelter because that person obviously left their dogs intact enough for them to mate and have babies, but wasn't responsible and committed to dealing with the fallout of that. So the two mom, the mom, dad, the whole litter were shipped up to Washington Boxer Rescue, um, Northwest Boxer Rescue in Washington State, which is how we found each other in a very similar way uh, to, to Laszlo's timing. And, you know, he was an absolutely phenomenal dog, right? Plus one for amazing dogs that are in rescue. And I had a lot of intention around when I got him and how I raised him. And that was a big reason for it. I spent the first six months of his life home, not working, raising that puppy. It's why he was a rock star and we were so bonded. Um, 
but I lost him before his sixth birthday to lymphoma. And he, after all those years of, of amazing holistic healthcare, raw fresh feeding, I couldn't have done anything better except for maybe skipped a couple of the vaccines that he still got in his adult life that, that I now know I wouldn't have gotten if I did, had it to do over again. Um, so genetics play a huge part, guys. And you know that was really important to me this time around to try to buffer uh, some of the potential heartache of an early loss by doing it right and going to the source of a lineage that I can see on paper is healthy and strong and well built. All right. Um, so this is really important. These these you know aspects of the conversation when you go the rescue route. God bless you. I'm in it. I do it every day. I have my foster dog in my bedroom right now. That's a six year old pit bull. It will take forever to find a home for because there's just that's not a dog that gets picked up around here. Um, but you know you've got a lot of risks that you can't plan for in that case. You have to just know that they're lurking out there. And you almost have to work even harder in those cases and spend more money to get ahead of it and be proactive. And I just want people to be educated about that and not ignorant and thinking that it's just cheaper from the start to go spend $75 at the Humane Society and get a needy puppy because ultimately if you don't know what breed, if you don't know if the right temperament's been determined, if you aren't matching it up right, you, you spend so much more in time and suffering and if you don't have health information on that puppy or you weren't prepared to get ahead of the curve on a puppy that's now been immunocompromised, over vaccinated in theory many times, um, spayed or neutered way too early. Spay and neuter is a huge hit to the immune system, by the way, guys. This is something you can't control when you go with rescue puppies. Shelters like to do them even at, at baby, baby, baby weeks of age. Um, to ensure that that puppy never gets a chance to reproduce and rescues will usually have a six months of age contract The puppy has to be spayed or neutered by six months of age when you put your puppy under uh, Anesthesia you're hit your taxing immune system when you go through a surgery like a spay or neuter and the anesthesia and the post-op Antibiotics and everything that's standard and pain meds you are setting that puppy up to have inflammatory responses to need to detox that stuff out of their system which takes months to do and it's yet another reason why we will see the dog with behavioral issues consistently six to 12 months later when the system has been cruising along with these hits. So this is kind of um, you know, an, an effort here to just bring some of the facts to you and, and empower you to have better perspective on the reality of sourcing and raising and which direction you may go in puppy acquisition. Um, it, it isn't a black and white thing, right? There's pros and cons in both directions. There's consequences in both directions. And it's really important to, you know, to be aware of that before you move forward. If you wanted to fix your dog, what would you say is a better age? It totally depends on what we're talking about trying to fix. Um, if we're talking about fear, earlier the better. If we're talking about a dog that's fearful and insecure, the sooner you start work on a dog like that to, to recondition associations, to put that dog in a mode of learning to stress and recover, whether it's people or dog related or both. Um, you know, if the dog, like the puppy's not afraid of the gunshots right now, right? He's just sacked out. If you've got a puppy that's petrified at this age of gunshots, you wanna march right toward all the stresses you can possibly expose that dog to now, and you'll have a much better chance, um, like Kai's dog, Finn, of taking a dog who scores low um, in terms of insecure, disconnected, not super sociable. If they score low on their temperament test, you can change them dramatically in many cases if you know how to address that and you get in there immediately at that eight to 12 weeks, at that three to six months age time frame, and you really do the things that are intentional um, and available to you to build that puppy up into a different outcome, behaviorally, temperamentally, right? So earlier the better on stuff like that. If we're talking about you know, fixing a drivey dog, right? The puppy's got a lot of drive and, and it's misguided and nobody gave it an outlet, developmentally what a what a dog can do physically when they've actually grown into their body right um, when those growth plates are closing and they're solid and you can work them a little bit harder um, you're gonna see different results in terms of progress resolving behavior issues and balancing that dog out perhaps in relationship with you a little bit later after the year marker versus trying to be able to do those things offer those puppy those solutions earlier on, they may still get frustrated and not be able to have access to, to what they want. This is really coming from 
you know, the average family owner, not just talking about dog trainers here, because we have a little bit of a different access to things typically, um, and a little bit of different knowledge base to be able to, to find workarounds to stimulate that puppy in either circumstance. But, you know, your dog really can't go for runs with you and even long walks in certain circumstances until after their growth plates close and they finish developing. And that's, that's a year. That's, you know, uh, waiting to do the neuter thing and all that jazz is, is after a year in most cases. So, um, sorry, I should have clarified about fixed being spay neuter. Sorry, I didn't grab that either. Um, I can't see the bottom of the comment since you don't get an option via a shelter. Um, oh, so I did kind of land on that answer. Uh, I didn't, uh, I should have caught that as well, Kinsey, sorry. Um, I think after a heat cycle for a female and um, after a year plus for a male, and you can check for growth plate closure with x-ray. So you can take your puppy literally into the vet and have x-ray to determine whether their growth plates have closed earlier or if they're not done still at a year. But I like to not do that surgery on a dog that's in any way unhealthy. So if I have a puppy or an adult dog who has loose stool, they're gassy, they have hot itchy skin, they're flaky, they have any kind of other allergy issues, ear infections, um, discharge from the nose, anything that shows me that dog's state of health is compromised, no surgery, no surgery. Deal with that first. Um, and Kai's doing, dealing with that right now with her dog, Finn, who's had you know diarrhea issues off and on. He got vaccinosis from one of his shots. He was throwing his food up multiple times per day, like eight to 10 times per day for months. Uh, holistic veterinarian switched his food protocol to cooked food. We've shared that with you guys on the page. That immediately changed it, immediately got rid of the problem. So she's been doing that for a few months now and has had some other supplements and, and different uh, support mechanisms to help with calming down his digestive system and getting him healthy and balanced out. She wants to neuter him desperately, but she will not do it until he's healthy, until this stuff is resolved, because going through that surgery is another hit to the immune system, and it could tip the scales and start this issue all over again. So... Spay and neuter, preferably after the dogs had a chance to mature and develop. For girls, we see that there is evidence, um, there have been some studies done in past years at least, that there's evidence the cancer rates for girls drastically decreases if you wait until after they've had a heat cycle. So they're typically gonna be at least a year. Um, some of those puppies will go through it much earlier on. And then for the boys, again, typically after a year. When the growth plates are closed, though, is what you're after, and that the dog is healthy. Don't do a surgery if your dog is unhealthy. It's, it's not worth it. Unfortunately, a lot of people will decide to do that out of convenience. Maybe the dog needs a treatment, or you know we're removing a cancerous mass. Let's spay or neuter at the same time. It's a very tricky gray area of what is most supportive to the immune system and what kind of consequences you might face if you do that. Um, you know, in general, you're looking for a healthy, healthy dog before you neuter. I'll be waiting at least a year for this one. Um, with rescue, like I said, with rescues and shelters, shelters already going to have done it 99.999% of the time. And, um, you need to know as an adopter, if my dog was fixed and they're just like four months old, I need to take them into a holistic vet. We need to get them immune support to detox the meds to build their, their immune system up, to decrease inflammation, yada, yada. It takes months to get that crap out of their system. Um, unless you're going, like our, our vet does a um, IV, like they run fluids. Um, if you choose to, to do that protocol, they run fluids through the dog while they're in surgery and after to get that crap out of their system faster. They also have different anesthetics. So they can give your dog an anesthetic that, that leaves the system immediately. So much less hard on their body, uh, much less residual autoimmune you know, result that is negative um, you know, compared to what the shelter is gonna have done or what a rescue will typically have done. Our rescues go and get the IV drip now. That's our standard practice. Um, so you know, really watching out for your choices that you have to make when you go through with that surgery around how strong and healthy your pup is or not and the type that you do. And if it's been done, you know, it'll, it'll have already been done by a shelter. A rescue is going to have a by six months contract, I guarantee you. Um, and a lot of times that six month mark for the puppy's not healthy. Um, you've maybe changed food when you, since you got them. Their tummy's upset. They're detoxing from whatever they were on before. There's so many reasons why that timeline is shit when it comes to doing a spay or neuter. And it's really unfortunate. Hey, Janet. 
Um, I'm just about to wrap up. This conversation was oh, big, but kind of a part one. Um, and we talked a whole lot about when not to get a puppy, uh, more than we talked about uh, who to choose as a puppy, but I covered a lot of territory today. So if you're late to the party, feel free to go back and watch the replay. I will give you one more peekaboo here of the sleepy Boo Bear. I'll pick him up, he's down below here. This is his, um, this is his place, he just, he's always at my feet. Um, but uh, we'll come back and we'll answer some more of the questions that come up from this particular video and, and with folks that want to get deeper down into the temperament assessment conversation. Um, if you're able to, as I said, answer all of those questions that I asked, and, and yes, truly, I am ready for a puppy and I know what, that I, you know, I'm staying the course no matter what happens in my life, I have resources for how I would deal with that. Um, then we can get more, you know, into temperament assessment and the nuance of, you know, understanding what you're going to have to do if you're choosing a puppy that is, you know, not deliberately a, a right, you know, balanced match for you. Temperament, personality, breed, genetics, you name it. If you're winging it and you're getting a rescue puppy because it's cute, then you've got some inalienable truths that you need to face about what might be ahead for you. Okay, let me grab them for you guys. Come here, little schnug. Come here, just so sleepy, drippy. Oh my gosh. He's exhausted because he's terrible in the crate. And we went and practiced our car manners today, and we dealt with a lot of tantruming in the box. Yes, we did. We dealt with a lot of tantruming in our box in the car because we're not good about our crate yet. <laughs> Leia, it would be so great if everyone would take the time and effort to make this kind of decision. Wouldn't it though? We would have a lot less unwanted dogs. We would have a lot less unwanted dogs. It truly is a people problem. Um, it truly, truly is a people problem. It's, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that, you know, it's, it's, our, it's our issue that we have so many dogs dying every day in shelters and rescues and it's really silly. Um, you know, we caused it, we can fix it, um, you know, we're responsible to fix it and, you know, we need to stop putting our, burying our head in the sand and thinking that, um, you know, that it's an, un, it's an insurmountable problem, um, other than for the fact that, uh, let's see if I can tip you down. Yeah, he's, he's a cutie, isn't he? Hold on, let's see. I should have just made this one ground stand. When we know better, we can do better. Yep, it's so true. Um, but you know, it's funny because common sense isn't common practice came up twice already today in my Leaders Lounge video and, and with my clients this morning. Um, you know, yeah, you're welcome, Leah. Thank you for being here and, and chatting it up with me too. Um, common sense is not common practice and that is most unfortunate. So. Um, you know, we won't see it completely resolved because of human nature, right? But we can absolutely make a huge fucking dent in it if we stop waiting for someone else to fix it. And we have the conversation and we, you know, speak the truth about the way things work. I've had uh, one, two, three rescue boxers before this one and all of them had massive health issues. Uh, you know, case in point, I lost Bosley before six years of age. My first one uh, died of um, probably a torsion. Um, he did make it to nearly nine years of age. He died on Halloween, which is another one of the serendipitous little nuanced things that's part of my story with this one. Um, and he was phenomenal dog, absolutely phenomenal dog. He was he lived the longest of any boxer I've ever had, and he came from a breeder. And the family that got him was everything I described to you guys earlier as not the right match to get a puppy. And that's how I ended up with him. And he was beautiful and stunning, but he was sick his entire life. Absolutely sick his entire life. So obviously not a great breeder, but um, you know, all of my other rescues, numerous boxer, foster dogs, um, numerous health issues, life cut short, you know, you name it. Some of these breeds are a crapshoot, guys. Some of these breeds, they're they're so prone to health problems, you know, you can do everything right and still run into those issues. But um, if you source well and properly and you do everything right, you can also get many, many happy, wonderful years together. And that is not something that um, you can have as much confidence in or, or as much of a guarantee 
when you don't know the background on your dog. That is the argument that we make for those of us that believe in sourcing from reputable breeders to preserve the best traits of these purebred dogs and you know to promote responsible ownership. These, these folks who do what they do, if they do it well, are the gatekeepers for not sending puppies to homes inappropriately versus the shelters um, and, and you know, worse yet, the stores who will let you take anything home. They will give you a leaflet that says, are you sure? But if you have the money and you want the animal, their job is to get them out. So, you know, I, I really do um, respect that it's taken some years to fully experience both sides of the coin. Um, but I have a very decent perspective of it now. And as a rescue director and, you know, seeing dogs come through, I can tell you, uh, adopt, don't shop is bullshit. And it's not, it's not the right way to go for a lot of people. And it's full of a lot of heartache for a lot of people. Marley, Marley being absolutely the most relevant example of that. And, you know, amazing dog, 100% deserved what we give him in rescue, what, what opportunity he got. But he was with his perfect match forever home at six years of age for only three months before he died of aggressive lymphoma. Devastating, devastating to the family, devastating to all of us, devastating. And it has everything to do with the fact that those dogs are amazing because their hearts mend but their body and a lot of times their behavior does not. If they did not get what they needed from the start genetically, they did not get what they needed um, behaviorally, environmentally, and nutritionally, can be absolutely devastating to fall in love with that dog only to have to say goodbye three months later because of the consequences that are incurred, the interest that's collected over time from those insults to the system. So. This is why we're having the conversation. This is why you guys have to be informed and you need to know that you have options and that there isn't a wrong one. There's just different consequences, as I said, in both directions, right? Um, it's a lot of work to do this thing and I'm exhausted. So, um, you know, do not get puppy fever here and think y'all should run out and do this. Uh, I full time do the dog mom thing, full time time and I'm exhausted. Did you hear that? <laughs> so don't get crazy here. Just, just soak up a little bit vicariously. Um, you know, for most of you who are not in a position to do the puppy thing right now and, um, you know, go walk a dog for a rescue organization, foster one first. Yes. Foster one first. You read my mind, Janet. Um, and, and, you know, really make sure that you can answer those questions that I brought up before. Okay. All right, Dolores, I see you. I'm just about to get off. Um, I got to go, guys. I'm thirsty and hungry and it's hot. And oh, yeah, I got to start working on this dog's crate issues again. <laughs> but I love you guys. You're awesome. And join me in the Leaders Lounge, okay? I hope that um, Allie maybe will get a chance to help me out here. We need to put a link in here for the lounge because I'm doing the gratitude thing all month in there. And I'd love to have you come join me, those of you that aren't already in there. It's such a great space. Uh, so come hang out in the Leaders Lounge. You can go search it and find it, and we'll uh, we'll get you in there to share your gratitudes around your dog life experiences. Okay, guys, and I will see you very soon. So will little Laszlo, Lady Killer. See you tomorrow, Auntie Allie. <laughs> see you tomorrow. Okay, thanks, Allie. Bye, guys. <laughs>